Hey everybody, I'm Pastor Jared here at Ridge United Methodist Church, and I want to welcome you to this week's Teaching Tuesday. Every Tuesday during the lunch hour, I upload these little 10 to 15 minute videos that will hopefully teach you something about the Christian faith and might even give you a tool to think about how God has been at work in your spiritual journey and maybe where God is working today, both in your life and in the world around you. These tools or these lessons might even be giving you something to think about how and where you want to go. Today's lesson uh, continues to pick up off of last week's lesson. If you did not get a chance to watch, I encourage you to go check it out because the lesson was about Bible mentors. Now, those people in the scriptures that you aspire to be like or whose experiences resonate with your own. There's a whole host of stories and people in the Bible that I look up to and want to become more like. People who point me to the God revealed in Jesus Christ. Well, there are other mentors in our lives, those who continue to pour in us today, as well as those who have come before us from whom we can learn. Uh, one such mentor or one such person is Augustine for me. He's an early church father who lived in the 4th and 5th centuries. And I want to talk to you a little bit about Augustine today, about a couple lessons that he has for us that I think will be helpful when thinking about another ongoing conversation in our world, a conversation that's revolving around these uh, face masks. Now, I've got a couple here in the office that I'll wear on Sunday mornings when I'll wear with other staff or people who are around. I've got some I keep in my car so that I can just throw it on if I'm buzzing into a store, grabbing something to eat or running an errand. We even have some at our house for us to wear. These masks are a topic of hot conversation about how effective they are in preventing the spread of disease, about whether or not we should be required to wear them, about uh, when and where it's appropriate or how long we should do so. That's a topic of big conversation. Now, for the most part, in my own personal experience, seem, people seem to be doing a really good job of wearing masks. Not everybody is, of course, and, and it's kind of annoying to do, but people are still doing it, both for their own well-being as also for the well-being of others. In fact, one of the neatest things that I've seen come out of this time are the ways in which people have been using their gifts and talents to make masks for other people. Uh, this bag was dropped off to us here at the church by a woman named Cindy who has made, I forget, Cindy, how many you've made now, 150, 175, somewhere along there, uh, that she is uh, making for folks in her life, including you, who are part of our church. And so if you don't have a mask and would like one, or if you'd like to have an extra one, please let us know because we'd be happy to mail you one or to uh, have one here at the church that you can swing by and pick up. Uh, I want to thank Cindy and you other people who have been making these and giving them out to folks in your life or here through the ministries of this church, even you who have uh, bought some and have dropped them off for us to use. Thank you, because this is a part of our new normal here at Ridge UMC. We're going to be needing to require to wear masks when we have meetings, when we do ministries, when we worship together uh, as a way to help hopefully contain or, or to slow down the spread of the virus as we seek to discern how to faithfully open up our building again. Now, this is a tough debate for lots of people and lots of organizations and businesses and worship places of worship, even in home lives, as we think about how we can interact with our neighbors or with family people uh, or family members throughout the area. It's a big conversation. And, and I think Augustine might help us have a way of framing these conversations. Uh, but before we talk about him, I want to talk about a story or rather interaction that I saw occur on social media the other day. Uh, one of my uh, mentors is a pastor in North Carolina who had posted an article and made a few comments about how even though churches can open up, they probably shouldn't yet. In fact, we've even seen a couple uh, or, um, examples of churches who have opened up maybe too soon. And, and when they did, the coronavirus actually spread throughout their congregation and they had to shut down again, at least their facility. It's a, it's a hard and it's a tragic lesson. And, and man, no one has like nefarious intentions with all of this. We all yearn to be together again. We all want to be in the same place to continue doing life together. 
But how we do that and when we do that, I mean, boy, there's, there's just no easy answer to this. Well, the pastor in North Carolina was making a few comments about some of his thoughts as he seeks to lead his congregation during this um, really difficult time. And there was one particular woman who you could read in her comments, her anger was just growing and escalating. It past the point of frustration or being irritable to a point where she was just downright mad. And I understand that because we all have tipping points, don't we? I mean, we all are being affected and this has been such a stressful and difficult time. And some of us are being affected way worse and way harder than others. But nevertheless, we all kind of reach a point where we just become angry. Like, oh, I wish we could get back to the way life used to be, even the simplest and smallest things. Uh, it's a manifestation of our grief. But this woman had said that she refuses to wear a mask. In fact, she said, quote, give me liberty or give me death. Like, I'd rather not, I'd rather die than, than continue to wear a mask and have my liberties infringed upon. Boy, that was a telling comment. And, uh, and, and I don't know what to make of it, but I do see this kind of growing resentment that's happening in pockets throughout our country and in persons, whether it's on social media or at these protest rallies that are happening around the world. There is a frustration or a tipping point, and I understand that. But let me go back to Augustine and see if there might be some overlap that can help us at such a time as this. First of all, uh, Augustine, uh, I want to tell you a little bit about him. He was just an incredibly gifted human being, intelligent, probably really good looking. I mean, he was the kind of guy who was smart, who was a great public speaker, who was really on that fast track to, to upper management. I mean, the guy was successful from a very young age and continued to be. He enjoyed uh, merriment, um, perhaps a little too much at times. He had a line of people who were following him. Augustine was a powerful and influential person who from the outside seemed to have it all. But Augustine later in life wrote an autobiography that he simply called Confessions confessing the ways in which his life had been affected along the way, and confessing how, quote, his heart was restless. No matter how much education he attained, no matter how many promotions he received, no matter how much uh, merriment he enjoyed, there was still a restless spirit within him. That no matter how much stuff he had, no matter how many uh, people he attracted, no matter his uh, levels that he had achieved, none of that was able to quench this ongoing thirst. No matter how much uh, alcohol he imbibed, there was never enough to satiate or to quench this restlessness inside of him. Our hearts are restless, Augustine said at a particular tipping point, until they find their rest in God. You know, he's saying that no matter how much stuff we have, no matter how big our homes are, no matter how nice our cars are, no matter the brands of clothing that we wear, no matter the level of education that we receive, that however we try to fill that gap or fill that restlessness, it's never going to do it. The only thing, the only one, the only person who can is God. And so that revelation, revelation came to Augustine in his confessions, uh, talking about how God needs to be the one who can calm our restless souls. I appreciate that of Augustine because I feel it. I understand it. I know the ways that I'm inclined to thinking that by buying more stuff or eating more food or, or attaining certain degrees or accomplishments, uh, how I hope or think that'll fill the need inside me, but they never do. Only God can do that. Well, that's one thing I've learned from Augustine. The other one is something you probably heard from me if you're part of the churches that I've been uh, pastoring at. It's something that I always come back to because I find it to be so true. Augustine wrote that there are two things that, uh, that we are inclined to do, or rather there's one fundamental disposition that God's trying to change to get us back to the ways that God wants us to be. He's saying that this restlessness all is derived from a spirit of curvatus. 
how we are, that's the Latin word, fundamentally curved inward. That like our trajectory that we're born into this world is fundamentally foremost about ourselves. We've got a couple young children at home. In fact, we've got a one-year-old and a three-year, soon to be three-year-old, who, uh, who, who learn at a very young age the word mine. I mean, how many of our children's fights and how many of our adult fights are centered around that word, mine, give me liberty, or give me death, about my mask and whether I should have to wear one or not, about whether I like this particular form of worship, or about where my seat is in the sanctuary or the fellowship hall. I mean, you know how many of our thoughts and how many of, how much of our restlessness centers around this truth, this curvatus of our spirit? Augustine reflects on those opening chapters chapters of Genesis that are really these beautiful stories, not just about some people who lived long ago, but really about the fundamental issue of humanity, how we have turned away from God and are bent inward or curved inward upon ourselves. Augustine says that's sin, that there's brokenness, that that's a flaw fundamental in humanity, that God is trying to heal or fix, that at our best, when God reorients us, we find ourselves in a spirit of rectitudo, of being in right orientation to God. And Jesus says in distilling what are the greatest commandments that we are called to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, that our restlessness becomes restful when we are rightly oriented to God. Jesus continues that, though, by saying that we are called to love our neighbors as ourselves. It's the shape of a cross, the ways that we are called to love God and to love those around us. That is when, according to Augustine, we are rightly ordered. And this then becomes fodder for our conversation. Because how much of the conversation in our world today and how much of the restlessness in your soul is derived or because of this? How much of your frustration or anger is derived from how this is all affecting you? About how this world or how the circumstances are about me and mine and affecting how I think or want things should be. Jesus invites us to not think about ourselves, but foremost about God and then for one another. You know, there's an early hymn in the life of the church. It's found in the book of Philippians or the letter of Philippians chapter two. It's this chorus that Christians used to sing about how they're called to emulate the life of Jesus. In your relationships, the passage begins. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. It goes on to talk about that, but immediately before the verses state, in humility, value others above yourselves. Don't look only for your own interests, but each of you look out for the interests of others. When we're rightly ordered, our lives don't become foremost about what we want or what we think should happen or about how we think things should go. When we're rightly ordered, when we find that peace, when we find that joy, it's when our lives are not about foremost ourselves, but about God and for the well-being of those around us. And so here's the touch point with those masks. The reason why I continue to wear one and why I will continue to wear a mask is because I'm looking out not only for my own interests and the interests of those I love, but I'm also looking out for yours and for the people around me. Each of us is called to become more like Jesus. And it's the same Jesus who became, who humbled himself and became obedient to death, even to death on a cross. That's the one whose mindset we are called to have. So I hope this gives you something to think about. I hope it provides you something to chew on as you think about the world that you are seeing on TV and as you think about the ways your world is being uprooted. 
that's not always a bad thing. Because there's some weeds that God's trying to uproot in this world and in your lives in order to make more room for new life, the life of Jesus, to be planted in you. Well, my 15 minutes are up. God bless you. God keep you. And may God's face shine upon you, even as you cover yours, just as Moses did when he came down from the mountain, hitting, hiding his, his face with a veil. Until next week, I'm Pastor Jared. Be blessed and be a blessing for others.